All right. Um, yeah, so um, Fabio from the AI team here at Cloudwalk uh, presented the paper club today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about informal prediction, uh, which is a set of techniques that allow you to make predictions uh, at a prescribed level of, of confidence. Um, so this is, techniques seem to be surprisingly simple to implement. Uh, but really powerful uh, because they're agnostic to the type of model that you use to make your original predictions. Uh, and they generalize well with not a lot of data dedicated to the, to the procedure. Um, so, yeah, all right, let's start with the, I'll, I'll keep some notes here on the, on the right side uh, and the paper on the left. But uh, yeah, let's start with the, the motivation for this sort of techniques and the procedure in general. Um, the main idea is that um, models in general, they have a serious problem with probabilities, probability calibration, meaning that the scores that are generated by models, they don't necessarily translate into the probability of a class being observed or a range being respected. Um, so, uh, I just want to give a quick example here. Uh, you know, be writing stuff here on the right. So, suppose you you have an image classification model, um, multi-class classification, like trained on ImageNet or something, um, and then you apply a, an image of a car on this on this model, and then you get the the resulting scores, right? So let's say that your model uh, responds with car with probability of 60%, uh, bus with probability of 20%, uh, train with 15%, uh, and I don't know, boat with uh, 5%. Right. So let's assume that this is the output of your model, right? Um, so if you wanted to get a prediction set with 90% chance of containing the actual class, right? So your intuition might be to just get those classes ordered in descending order of the score or the output probability, right? Uh, so this would be the output of your software. So if you want to have 90% uh, confidence that your actual label is within the, the predictions, you could greedily add the, the classes until they add up to 90%, which is your desired uh, confidence, right? So you could say that car has 80%. When you add bus, it's an 80% probability of being either a car or a, or a bus. And then when you add the train, you have a 90% probability of your image belonging to this set, right? Being either a car, a bus, or a train. So this would be a very intuitive way of generating the, the set that has 90% chance of containing the actual class. Uh, the problem is that these probabilities are not calibrated. These this is a score generated by uh, applying a softmax function on the output of your uh, last layer in your neural network. Uh, so you're basically just getting the scores for each class and squishing them in a way that generates uh, that they all sum, they all add up to one, right? So these are not probabilities. So if you did this for a large uh, a large test set, if you follow this procedure for a large test set, and always look for a, you follow this procedure to get your 90% uh, set, right? You get the, the set with the 90% probability of containing the actual, the actual label. You will not be right 90% of the time. So this is not going to be correct uh, at the ratio that you would expect, simply because the probabilities are not calibrated. So I think this is this is the main point, right? Uh, I think we tend to look at scores between zero and one and think that they are probabilities automatically. They're not. Your scores 
And the, the whole point of applying these conformal prediction techniques is to find a, uh, to define the procedure that generates sets that actually have this prescribed uh, confidence, uh, pres prescribed probability of containing the actual label. So that's the whole point here. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about. Um, all right. So this up again. Um, cool. So yeah, th this paper discusses uh, the techniques of informal prediction. This is a, an introduction. I don't think, I don't even think this was published in a conference or something. This is not a research paper. Um, but the the interesting thing is that it introduces the techniques and also provides examples of how to apply this idea in several different uh, settings. Um, the setting for a multi-class classification um, is the one that's more intuitive to, to understand. Um, so here there it includes an example on, on ImageNet, right? So these are three images of the same they would receive the same class, right? The fox squirrel. Uh, and they are ordered here according to uh, an increasing level of difficulty, right? The first one is pretty obviously a squirrel. The other one, you're looking at the squirrel face on. Uh, it's a little more difficult to, to classify. And the other one could not, could even be another different animal, right? Um, so if you apply those techniques, you will be able to provide a set uh, that will contain the actual class 90% uh, of the time or 95% of the time or whatever level of confidence you want. So in this first one here, it's pretty easy. You will see a set that contains only this one class because uh, the, the model is pretty sure. In the second one, you have four different uh, plausible classes. Uh, the Fox squirrel has the largest score, but you need to increase the the size of the set a little bit to reach this uh, level of, uh, of confidence that you're interested in. And the last one is the, the most difficult one. You still get the fox squirrel here, but it might even be a mislabel in, in the data set. Uh, you, you get uh, a slightly higher probability in other class effect. Um, so yeah, so this is what we're trying to do. Um, so. The, the idea here is that you would need uh, you need to look at the scores generated from your model or whatever prediction method you're using. You, you need to treat them not as probabilities, but uh, as a heuristic measure of uncertainty. Uh, so the idea is if you have a large score, that means that you have a, a large probability of that class or that prediction being right, but it doesn't necessarily need to translate into probability because you're applying conformal prediction to correct that um, that score into uh, the proper set. All right, so um, there are a few points that are really central to to the techniques, right? So, what what do you want to accomplish? Um, first of all, you want to be able to find you you want to be able to define a procedure uh defines the sets uh that have the prescribed coverage that you want so coverage would be like one minus the error rate so it would be uh if i want my classifier to to contain the correct class 90 percent of the time so that's the proper coverage you you want to have uh, statistical guarantees that your method produces sets that respect this coverage. Um, so, and, all right, so this is one of the things that we're going to accomplish with conformal prediction, right? You, you're going to find the procedure that generates those sets with the minimum coverage, but also you want a small uh, set size, right? You, you don't want to just predict, like include everything in the set. You want it to be uh, as small as possible. You want to include as few classes in your set as possible. Um, so I think this is well illustrated in this inequality here. So uh, we don't need to really unpack the, the equation, but uh, so the probability of the, the label 
being contained in your prediction test, it is larger than your desire, your prescribed uh, probability, right? Alpha is the error rate. So uh, here in, we would say something like alpha is 10%. So the probability of containing the actual label would be larger than 90%. But also, it would be smaller than this 90% plus a little correction depending on the size of the calibration set. So if you look in the aggregate, if you look at a, your a, a large set of samples that you're evaluating this on, uh, if you run the procedure to get 90% uh, coverage, you don't want to get 95 because this means that your, your sets are getting unnecessarily big. And so there's some guarantees that you'll be kind of around uh, very close to the to the your prescribed level of, of confidence uh, so that you get the, the smallest set size uh, possible. And the third thing is being able to adapt to the difficulty of the sample. So this is an important characteristic also. So just like we saw in this example here, uh, when you have an easy sample, you want your set to be small, right? You want to, to be more assertive. This is the this is the category with the uh, with a large probability of, of being the, the correct one. So you want the size of your set to be adaptive to the difficulty of the samples. Uh, you don't want them to contain always the same number of the top n uh, predictions or something. So this works as a measure of how difficult uh, the example is. All right. Um, so how do we do this thing? Let's talk a little bit about the procedure. Um, all right. So here's the outline of the, the procedure, what, you're, what you need to follow. And this kind of applies to several different types of, of models and problems. Just follow this four step. Uh, process and, and it's going to work. Um, so yeah, first thing you need to do is you want to define what it is that you're using as the notion of uncertainty. What score are you using as a notion of uncertainty coming from your model, right? Um, you could use this notion of, of uncertainty as uh, one minus the, the predicted score from the from your model or something like this. So if your model outputs a score of 99%, uh, your uncertainty score would be 1%. So you, you want to define some some type of notion of heuristic notion of uncertainty, and it's usually go going to come from the predictions generated by your model. Um, and you want the score to be um, ordered in a way such that large scores mean uh, more uncertainty. Um, because then like, you're going to calculate this score for all for all of your samples in a calibration set. And what you do is um, you're going to compute the quantile uh, of these calibration scores uh, you're going to compute the quantile that corresponds to your desired level of, of confidence, right? So this is the actual quantile you need to compute, but like this is n plus one over n. This is basically a correction on the on the size of your calibration set. So basically, you're like if you have an error rate, if you want an error rate of 10%, you're basically computing the 90% quantile of your scores. Right, so build a histogram of your scores and find the the threshold that generates the desired error rate. Um, and then when you find this this observed quantile here, all you have to do is use it as a threshold to generate the the prediction set. Right, so. That's basically all you have to do. Uh, there's some simple samples of code here, and it's usually like six lines of code or something. Uh, it's it's simple to implement. Um, so 
Now I wanted to go through some of the examples of how to use this in different settings uh, for different types of models. And I think this will kind of materialize a little more uh, what is the procedure. Um, so I want to find this one, All right? So adaptive prediction sets. Uh, so this is the best technique that uh, that we have so far for the the multi-class classification uh, problem, right? So finding the set that contains, uh, let's say, ninety percent of the that has a ninety percent chance of containing the actual class, um, and this the technique here corresponds precisely to doing what was our intuition. Uh, you order the predicted classes in descending order of their score, and then you greedily include one by one until you cross this, this certain threshold. Uh, and the trick here is like you use the quantiles, you use the idea of conformal prediction to find what's the threshold uh, that guarantees you that 90% coverage. Uh, so in the original idea, we were just summing the probabilities until we got, we're summing the scores until we got the total score of 0.9, which intuitively would correspond to 90% probability. Um, the only additional thing here is instead of going straight, like, um, using the 0.9 as the, the cutoff threshold, we're actually going to determine the appropriate threshold based on the quantiles of the score function. Um, so what we would do here is, let me see if there's an English. All right. Um, so how we will do this? Um, we need to set aside the calibration set. Uh, it's usually like 500 samples, 500 to 1,000 samples. You set aside the calibration set. Then for each of the samples in the calibration set, uh, you order the classes according to the descending uh, score generated, generated by the model. And then you generate a, a, a set by adding those uh, uh, predicted classes until you get the correct class, right? So um, in, the, in the example here with the squirrel, what we would do is, for this sample, we would get a set with the fox squirrel, squirrel. For this sample, we would also get a set with only the fox squirrel because it's the correct sample. And then in this set, we would get a generate a set with the marmot and the fox squirrel. Um, then what you do is you add up the scores of the classes that you inclu included in, the, in your set via this procedure, right? So in the first sample, the, the sum of the predicted uh, score was 99. The second one was 82. In the third one, it was 0.3 plus 0.22, which is 0.55. So you calculate this, this number for all of your samples. Um, and then after you calculated the number for all of your samples, you just plot the histogram and then you find the place uh, in the histogram, uh, the value that uh, will uh, cover 90% uh, of your of your sample. So this will generate the the cutoff threshold that you need to use when making new predictions. Uh, this will be the cutoff threshold that you use to include elements in the prediction set. And that's all. Uh, uh, for multi-class classification, that's all you, you need to do. You just use the compiles to find a, a threshold that is more appropriate than, than the intuitive 90%, which you would expect if the scores were probabilities. All right, um, I'm going to go through a few more examples here. Um, so this adaptive prediction sets, uh, I think that's that's most intuitive because it corresponds to what we would expect to be able to do uh, based on the original scores. Uh, but you can also use this for regression, which is really interesting. Um, so 
what you can do here if you're doing a, if you're working on a regression problem um, if you wanted to generate confidence intervals the the traditional way would be to do something like quantile regression right so instead of fitting the fitting your model to find the expected value of the observed variable uh, you could fit one model with uh, uh, asymmetrical loss function right you fit one model uh, to find an upper bound and then you fit another model to find the lower bound so you would fit like one model for the uh, five percent quantile and another model for the 95th percent quantile and then you would have this 90 percent confidence bend uh, that your that your actual observed values would fall within this range right um so yeah if you're fitting quantile regression this might be what you would expect but because of several factors like not having an infinite uh, training set uh your predicted quantiles will not actually not really correspond to the to the actual quantiles right so your prediction range that you fit with quantiles that would be able to kind of determine this 90 percent confidence range uh they will be narrower or wider uh, a little bit narrower or wider than the actual uh true range right um so the idea here is to find uh a correction that makes your uh, range a little bit wider or a bit a little bit narrower uh so that you can really expect 90 percent of your observations to be within this range um so the way we would do this is we first fit a model to predict the, the quantiles right and then what we use what we use as the score as the the measure of the uncertainty uh, we can use um, the distance between like get a calibration set right 500 to a thousand samples get a calibration set and then in this calibration set you find the distance that you would need to move the boundaries in order for one of the boundaries to actually hit your observed point so this would be like how much fat do you have in your prediction band uh, so if a certain prediction point is within the range you could decrease the band a little bit to meet that observed point on the other hand if your observed point is outside of the prediction range you could widen it a little bit until you meet that particular uh, point in your calibration set so what you do is you calculate this uh, this score this adjustment to the range that you will need to do in your entire calibration set um, and then you find the quantile that corresponds to your desired error rate uh, so basically what you're doing is you're finding a correction to your range that ensures that in your calibration set uh, 90 percent of the points would be within the range and then this will generalize to to new observations um, so yeah for doing this type of regression what you would you would use conformal prediction to find the correction that is more appropriate to apply uh, in your prediction ranges um, just as a curiosity we were doing something similar with the the profit uh the real profit library right because we're fitting models to predict a range for some observed variables uh, of our own operations right so number of transactions or something so we were fitting which is something that is basically a regression right to predict the uh using quantiles to predict a range for the expected observed values in the future and then we would classify as an anomaly uh, anything that is outside of this range uh, and then it became pretty obvious that uh, even though we were fitting the five percent and 95 percent quantiles 
we were not getting 90% coverage of the observed point. So we were, we're doing an extra step. So we fit this 90% coverage interval uh, using the puntiles. And then we were looking for a, uh, a uh, kind of a gain on the width of the window to make it wider or narrower. But we were kind of we were multiplying the the width to match the 90% coverage that we wanted. So we were kind of doing conformal prediction naively by multiplying the the size of the window instead of doing a a fixed correction. All right. Um, yeah, moving on. Um, you can also apply this to models that by design will output uh, a measure of uncertainty. Like if you have a model that makes the predicts two things, right? The model outputs the expected value, like the point estimate of, a, of your variable, but also predicts the standard deviation on that value so it is directly predicting uh, a measure of uncertainty you can use conformal prediction to adjust that expected level of uncertainty to actually match the covers that you want so you can you can use those types of corrections uh, to actually translate your model's prediction into like an actual variance or standard deviation uh, of something like uh, an ensemble of models or uh, the effect of dropout in a neural network, uh, the uh, robustness to perturbations in the variables. Um, so yeah, you can use the this idea of finding the proper quantile uh, to actually calibrate this measure of uncertainty from a model that predicts uh, uncertainty explicitly. Um, all right. Now, there's another idea I wanted to talk about here. Um, this. Um, right. So um, the paper also covers some extensions to the to the basic technique, right? Um, and how we can slightly modify this to um, match uh, the slightly different objectives. So one of the ideas is uh, you might want your, your conformal prediction procedure to be group balanced. Um, so in your particular problem, it might not be sufficient to have like 90% coverage, let's say. Um, you might be interested or you might have a requirement to, to ensure this level of coverage for separate classes. So for example, uh, if you're predicting, like looking at a, a medical exam and predicting uh, probabilities of diseases, uh, you might want to impose that 90% of the cancer cases uh, get included in the set. So um, you're, basically you're in, you would be interested in uh, ensuring this uh, coverage property, not only the entire set of samples, but also in subsets. Like the ones that are labeled cancer, you want 90% of them to be covered in the, in the prediction set. Um, or you can, you can also be interested in uh, ensuring this coverage in subsets of your features. So you could select a certain feature and beam the values uh, and make sure that in each beam you, you get 90% coverage. Uh, so like, you, you might want to be able to ensure that your model gets 90% coverage for both uh, merchants with low TPV and merchants with high TPV. Uh, we might have different behaviors and the model might be a little overconfident or underconfident uh, in separate groups of, of same. Um, so the way to, to achieve this is by uh, the, uh, defining, finding the proper quantiles 
um, separately for each of the groups. Uh, so you would get your calibration set. Um, and instead of finding the, the proper threshold, finding the proper threshold using the quantile in, that you observe in the entire set, um, you would do this, find this threshold separately for different sets of your, of your samples. So yeah, this is a good description here. So like, suppose this is your calibration set, right? Um, and you want to, uh, ensure coverage separately, like independently for the blue group and the green group. Uh, you want to, to ensure a certain level of performance for both of them. You can plot this histogram separately for the two groups of samples and then define the cutoff threshold uh, via the quantile uh, in both groups separately. Um, so, um, this would result to something like uh, you include the fox in your prediction set when the fox has a score over 50 percent but you include the dog when you when the dog has a, a score over 60 percent or something like this so the scores could be slightly different uh, for each of the categories for each of the groups that you want to uh, be able to enforce uh, the the required coverage All right, so another cool property here. Um, so yeah, this this is interesting also. So we were talking about um, using the procedure to ensure uh, this rate of miscovers, right? So you would ensure that 90% um, of the correct uh, class, the correct 90% of the samples where you apply this procedure would have the correct class inside the, the prediction set. Uh, you can also use this to, to different types of, uh, of losses and you can apply a function to your, uh, to the quality of your prediction set uh, and still ensure that the expected value of this uh, loss function is uh, around the range that you're that you're specifying. So to make this a, a little bit more explicit, so uh, instead of looking for the 90% coverage, for example, uh, we could use those techniques to to ensure that we get prediction sets that have 90% recall, uh, or ensure that we we. Get, that we create sets that will uh, accept a certain level of risk. And you can define the risk uh, and calculate the value of the risk in a per sample basis, right? Um, so we could use those ideas to, to make predictions that achieve a certain level of risk that could be something like, uh, I don't know, how much money is exposed um, because we either uh, made a, a false positive mistake or a false negative mistake. Um, so the only modification you would do is instead of, like, when calculating the scores, you wouldn't uh, only get the scores based on the probability, but you would get the scores based on this notion of the risk associated with uh, that with each particular sample. And then you find the quantile uh, that will be used as a threshold. You find the quantile that uh, will ensure this prescribed level of risk. All right. Another point I wanted to make is about outlier detection. Uh, so this is useful also. Uh, if you have uh, an algorithm that outputs uh, an anomaly score, for example, something that outputs uh, uh, a notion of how anomalous a, a particular sample is in your distribution, right? You can use precisely the same technique to ensure that the probability of the point being considered an outlier 
uh, is close to your prescribed level. Uh, so what you can what you can do is um, train your model, make the predictions, and then in your calibration set you can find a threshold for your model so such that 99% uh, of the samples would be considered normal and 1% would be considered anomalous. Uh, so this gives a lot of control over uh, how frequently uh, you're going to classify your uh, a sample as an anomaly, right? Uh, so this, yeah, so this gives a lot of control over uh, when like uh, how far you're going to go in terms of the predicted anomaly score that generates a certain frequency of points that are considered outliers. And the procedure is uh, exactly the same. Like get the quantile, get, define the score, uh, and then you get the, the appropriate quantile in the scores that will give you this uh, frequency of, of coverage. All right. So those are all the examples. The examples I wanted to discuss. Uh, there are a few points here on how to evaluate uh, the if your implementation is correct. Evaluation, evaluate if everything is working. Um, so yeah, the, some points they discuss the the evaluation of how adaptive the adaptive in the coverage so how adaptive the the set is um so there's an idea Let's see if i find the proper equation here yeah all right so this is a this is an interesting point um there's a difference between marginal and conditional coverage right so let's say you define your procedure so that in 90% of the samples, the correct label is going to be inside of the set. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean that for each possible group of the samples, you're also getting this exact prescribed coverage, right? Uh, so there's some examples here. So in, like, for a classification, um, you're covering 5% of the first group. So this means that for only those green points here, the actual label was inside the set, and you're covering 14% of the second group. So this is a 90% coverage in either group. Uh, so the, the procedure is uh, inappropriate for both groups here. Uh, but you can also have this, this marginal case where you have 100% coverage in the first group and 80% in the second. So in the aggregate, you're going to have the 90% that you that you wanted and that you, you did the calibration for, uh, but it doesn't translate into the proper coverage for each of the groups separately. Um, now, ideally, what you would want to observe is this type of coverage, right? It's uniform across different groups. Um, so yeah, there's there's this difference. Uh, the procedure ensures that you get coverage uh, in a marginal sense. So uh, you get a large set of samples, and then if you do the procedure to get 90% coverage, you're going to have 90% uh, correct predictions for 90% of the samples. Uh, but it doesn't ensure conditional coverage. Um, now there's some ways to to evaluate. Uh, you can evaluate how well the marginal coverage translates to the conditional coverage. Um, you can evaluate how well this uh, notion of covering 90% of the cases in the entire set translates to different slices. So there are two ideas that that they present here. Um, you can do this stratified by the features. Um, so this will be equivalent to, to splitting your samples into groups uh, and evaluating if the coverage is appropriate for each of those separate groups. Uh, so you could do something like um, 
evaluate if the procedure is working properly for low TPV merchants and high TPV merchants, let's say. So this will be stratified uh, according to one of the features used by your model or uh, stratified according to, to clustering of the features or something like this. You can also evaluate if this is this is working uh, stratified according to your labels, right? Uh, so fraudsters get 90% coverage and no fraudsters get 90% coverage also. So this is another thing to, to look at when evaluating. Um, but also something that is interesting to understand if your uh, implementation is working correctly and if it's being useful is to check whether the, you have similar coverages um, for any size of the prediction set, right? Because again, you want this adaptivity to be a, a, a characteristic of your procedure, right? You want easy samples to generate a small set and difficult samples to generate a larger set. Um, so one way to look at this, there's no plot here. One way to look at this is evaluate the coverage for each size of your prediction set. So prediction set with one category, are they achieving the 90% coverage? With two categories, are they achieving the 90% uh, coverage? Um, so yeah, this would ensure that, you're, that uh, the procedure is generating uh, prediction sets that are adaptive to the difficulty of the, of the samples. All right. Um, next point. There's the there's a discussion on the size of the calibration set, um, and uh, the point they make here is that uh, the quantile that you're going to define uh, as a cutoff threshold for your for your procedure, right, for defining the the set. This threshold is a is a probabilistic variable. Right? And if you define like 1,000 different calibration sets, this quantile is going to be slightly different uh, in this 1,000 sets. Um, and it's going to follow probabilistic distributions, we're gonna follow a better distribution. And naturally, the larger the size of your calibration set, the more concentrated this distribution is uh, around the actual value that you chose around the the, le the selected level of coverage um, so they show this here like if you in, in one of the examples they ran um, if you select a calibration set with only 100 samples uh, you're going to have a kind of a wider margin of this of the observed coverage according to the stress um, so in general what the observe is that um, to keep a, a like if you if you select if you want a level of coverage of ninety percent, uh, if you select a calibration set with a thousand samples, you're going to get something around eighty-eight to ninety-two coverage. Uh, so at around one one thousand samples, you start to get um, a coverage that is pretty close to your desired. Uh, level. So usually the point is that usually you don't need a, a really big calibration set to define the threshold for the for the prediction set. All right. And last point, uh, they recommend that if you're running your formal prediction method, something else you can do is um, you have you have a validation set right for your for your for the model you're training uh, what you can do to make sure that everything is working is um, take your validation set and split it between validation and calibration uh, so you use the calibration set to defer to determine the thresholds right and evaluate the coverage on the validation set. Something you can do is do like 
hundreds of different splits between validation and calibration and calibrate on the calibration set, evaluate on the, the validation set and check that the coverage is as expected. If you do a large number of those splits, um, you would be able to observe that the coverage is uh, very like very close to your prescribed level. It's going to have some, some random noise, but should be close to your prescribed level. All right, so yeah, this is this is all I wanted to talk about. Uh, just go back to the procedure here because I think this is useful and it's surprisingly simple to apply. On. And I would recommend if you're interested in uh, applying this to to your model or whatever it is you're working on. Um, I think this. This paper here is a good introduction, simple to read, it has lots of examples that you can adapt to, to your problem. Um, and yeah, let's start thinking about uh, probabilities instead of scores. <laughs>